Good afternoon. We're going to get started. I'm Judge Victor Rodriguez, a judge at the Alameda County Superior Court and chair of the Language Access Subcommittee of the Judicial Council's Advisory Committee on Providing Access and Fairness. As the moderator of today's webinar, I'm pleased to welcome you to our overview of language access services in the courts and recent innovations. Today's webinar is the first in a series of three language access educational webinar sessions for courts and court stakeholders to discuss the challenges and opportunities involved in maintaining access to justice for California's approximately 7 million limited English proficient residents and potential court users, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic era. During today's webinar, our panelists will provide an overview of language access services available in the courts. They'll highlight specific recent initiatives the courts have taken to expand access to justice to the courts for linguistically diverse court users, such as incorporating technology. The webinar will be 45 minutes long. The session is taking place live via Zoom and is also being recorded. The video recording will be made available on the California Judicial Council's language access webpage for future viewing. The agenda materials for this session are posted to the language access webpage. Before introducing our panelists, I want to take a brief moment to provide an overview of the California's Judicial Council's efforts to continue to serve the courts and LEP court users over the past year. California is the country's most populous and diverse state. Approximately 20 million, I'm sorry, 20 percent of all Californians, including 7 million individuals, are limited English proficient speakers. More than 200 languages and dialects are spoken in the California courts. The provision of high quality language access services by qualified court interpreters is essential for courts to provide equal access to justice for LEP court users. There's approximately 1,900 certified and registered California court interpreters, and on average, the courts provide almost 1 million interpretations per year. Due to the pandemic, California courts have had to immediately strategize and implement solutions to provide all court services, including language access services, even when the physical courtrooms were closed. You'll hear about some of those solutions today. In my courtroom in Alameda County, we've provided all hearings via Blue Jeans for now almost a year. And as you can imagine, language access services continues to be a critical function of how we help our primarily self-represented litigants. We've done that through innovation and through learning over this past year of how to use blue jeans, how to use bridge lines um, in order to provide language access services for those people who wanna access our courts. During this time, the Judicial Council has continued to provide support, resources, and grant opportunities to assist courts in providing language access services. Examples of this includes the following. The Judicial Council's Language Access Services Program has been in regular communication with the language access representatives from each of the 58 counties over the past year. Staff has conducted monthly virtual meetings to share information, best practices, and resources with the courts, especially during the pandemic. In the spring and fall of last year, the Judicial Council also approved grants through our annual signage and technology grant program for various courts, multilingual signage, and other technology infrastructure pro projects, including software and equipment. These projects are intended to support court efforts in providing language access and will assist LEP court users with navigating the courts and accessing services. The Judicial Council also continues to support video remote interpreting efforts and is currently working on establishing a VRI program, which will include VRI trainings for judicial officers, court staff, and court interpreters. Additionally, the Judicial Council continues to maintain and update an online language access toolkit, which includes multilingual educational materials and resources to assist the courts in serving LEP court users and to inform court users about language access services and basic court processes. The third webinar in this language access series will provide more information on these resources. Now let's move on to today's program. We're very fortunate to be joined by three panelists with firsthand knowledge and experience in promoting language access and implementing strategies to meet the needs of LEP court users. Our panelists today are Michelle Minsuk, a federally and court certified Spanish court interpreter and the interpreter services manager at the Alameda County Superior Court. Jessica Thompson, the information technology director of the Santa Barbara Superior Court. And Paula Cusolo Findicolo, the deputy director of the court services division of the New Mexico Administrative Office of the Courts. We'll start our panel discussion with Michelle Minsuk. Good afternoon, Michelle. Good afternoon, Judge Rodriguez and everybody else. Uh, thank you. Sure. So for the first question, in your role as the interpreter services manager of the Alameda County Superior Court and as a certified court interpreter, can you share some of the ways in which language access services have continued to be provided during the pandemic? 
Sure. So at the outset of the pandemic, as you'll probably recall, it was a first scramble to understand what we would be doing, how and where. So a lot of efforts went into um, keeping staff informed of which hearings were going to be in person and how we would be handling that from a logistics and safety standpoint. Um, the court invested um, some funds in additional wireless equipment so that interpreters who were working on site would have access to equipment that would allow two-way communication so that um, conversations they had to have with defendants could be done at a distance and not the way they normally would work in a courtroom sitting right next to or standing right next to a defendant. Um, then on the other side, there was the initiation of blue jeans, which continues to be a work in progress of getting first our staff interpreters um, up and running and able to use the platform, and then expanding that knowledge to our large extended team of contractors who vary in levels of experience with interpreting and also levels of comfort with technology um, and helping them understand how to uh, use that platform uh, that create that included creating an ad hoc training which I will admit if I were to watch it now is 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 lacking but it did at least explain to interpreters how to manage being in the online environment, which we had never experienced. Um, you mentioned in your introduction, the use of a phone bridge, um, and that continues to be a tool that is used in different formats um, in our court. Um, there's what I would call the actual phone bridge, which is using the court's conference line system so that an interpreter can be on blue jeans listening to the hearing and interpreting in the hearing as well as connected on the phone in this bridge with a litigant so they can interpret simultaneously without interrupting the hearing for consecutive interpretation. Um, it does not work in every single case or in every single situation. Um, the other situation where we're using something like a phone bridge is with um, the in-custody inmates who are appearing via video. Um, and in that case, the deputies work with our interpreters and provide them a phone number where the interpreter can call into the room at the jail where the inmates are accessing blue jeans and speak with them. And other efforts included working with justice partners such as the public defender's office and also the court-ordered alienists who provide psychological evaluations to find alternatives to meeting in person, including using phone and video. Thank you. And so obviously, you know, I often use the analogy that this is like building a plane while you're flying in midair, that looking back <laughs> 10 months ago, we had no inkling of how we were going to have hearings or what language access would look like. Um, from my perspective as a department that primarily deals with self-represented litigants, I'm amazed how much service we've been able to provide given how little notice we had to build this up. And I'm just wondering if you could look back on the last 10 months and give us a sense of whether interpreters, bench officers that you work with, court staff, if you see that kind of track of improvement as we've been learning about best practices and what has worked and what things we kind of need to tinker with. I do see improvement. I also see a lot of room for improvement, although I have my fingers crossed that we won't have that much time where we have to improve on this. <laughs> but um, I, I, I do think that we could continue to improve um, with staff training and also training for bench officers, as well as for interpreters, as far as best practices, uh, using these remote technologies, um, also, better outreach to the public in a multilingual format to help them, which is a very large project. Um, one of the impediments I, I have observed in quality language access is the, the parties and litigants struggles with using the technology or access to having more than one device or a good internet connection, all of that. Um, 
so yeah, I, I definitely see we could improve and also better infrastructure. One of the uh, challenges that I know many of the interpreters on my team have experienced uh, is the simple problem of sound quality, um, which is very difficult to manage when you have people in multiple locations with using their own personal devices, but it makes a very big difference in how they can do their jobs. And so some of that answer talks about what we've learned from the last 10 months in continuing language access in the current COVID-19 posture. And I'm just wondering if there are lessons that you've learned that might continue this type of lessons we've learned for the last 10 months that might continue to allow us to provide language access even once the COVID-19 pandemic is over and things start returning to some sense of normalcy. Are there things that lessons to be learned in terms of these last 10 months for once we're back to having people in the courtroom? Um, some people may still request to be able to appear remotely because of health concerns or because of convenience. Um, are there other things that we can take from that? Um, yes, I think one lesson that we've learned and perhaps not entirely integrated into our practices, but we're, we're working towards it, is um, improving the seamlessness of our communications between the interpreter's office, the interpreters, the courtroom clerks, the bench, and the parties who will be participating so that everybody has the fullest set of information possible prior to the beginning of a hearing. Um, we have made some strides um, towards that using our um, online schedule program where we have been able to modify it slightly to include new fields and instructions for interpreters um, and working on now getting those fields completed uh, timely and making sure that the interpreters have seen the instructions and that also courtroom clerks are aware of the instructions so people work together better. Great. So one last question. So you mentioned online resources and obviously a lot of the litigants are no longer to come into the physical courtroom, physical courthouse to talk to people in the self-help center. Are there things that we can improve in terms of our online access to provide explanations, documents, services, and other languages so that people are kind of oriented in terms of the entire process in a language that they can understand? Yes, I definitely think so. Our court um, does need to undertake a, 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 an overhaul of our website, which would include a multilingual overhaul, but also an ease of use overhaul, which would benefit anybody who's using the court. We do have an avatar uh, on our website that can handle some traffic interactions that is in Spanish, as well as um, a, a Chinese written script. And um, I do believe that a good deal of the public interact with that avatar. It would be wonderful if the court could expand along those lines for court users and other case types to handle some of the more routine interactions that happen with the court and gain information in both written and verbal format about how to handle court processes and where to go. I think that would be great. Great. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you. Now, let's move on to our discussion with Jessica Thompson. Thank you for joining us, Jessica. Hi, of course. Hi, Hi. everybody. So the Santa Barbara Court has successfully adopted the use of Zoom, unlike Alameda County, which uses blue jeans. Santa Barbara uses Zoom to provide remote hearings and currently uses the simultaneous feature to provide interpretations. Can you share a little bit about the court's process and experience in adopting that platform? Sure. So just a quick overview of our court. We're a medium-sized court. We have about 26 courtrooms countywide, um, two main courthouses 75 miles apart. Santa Barbara is in South County. Santa Maria is in North County. Uh, Santa Maria is known for having a large farming community, which introduces a handful of different languages and dialects. So we have a lot of different interpreters in different languages that go through our court, like many others, but just so you know. Um, so we... The implementation of Zoom remote video appearance became like it did with everybody else, kind of a free for all trying to get things together and in order as the court closures came about. Um, we kept two of our, uh, our two arraignment courtrooms open, so we needed a solution for that. We looked into Zoom, Teams, WebEx, BlueJeans, and chose Zoom primarily because of the interpretation module feature, as well as the breakout rooms. 
so that's how we landed on Zoom in general. Um, we piloted it in the two arraignment courtrooms. We learned as we went. We grew. As the other courtrooms we opened, we ended up uh, using this using Zoom in all courtrooms. So that's how we're using it now. Um, we currently have interpreters sitting in rooms adjacent to our courtrooms, just so everybody's clear on that. They're not inside the courtrooms. If they wanna join remotely, they can, but we have a lot of um, kind of interview rooms set up now for interpretation, for interpreters to use. Um, so there's a couple reasons that we were had success with Zoom. I can go into the details of how we're using it if people are interested, that, but that might be something that people can specifically reach out for if they want more information on how to use the features. But one of the main reasons that it stuck was because one of our interpreters was already trained with Zoom. She knew the interpretation feature really well. And I think that saved us because she was able to teach the other interpreters. She was able to help the judges. She was part of testing and go live and organized training and created documentation, which was a huge piece in this for us. And we also have a huge, you know, we have a really awesome help desk staff that was there, is still there almost every day in the courtrooms, just trying to, to get this up and running every day. Um, I liked your example of, <clears throat> you know, there is no, there is no endpoint to this. It's evolving every single day. It's a mess one day. It works great the other day. So I just want people to be clear on that. But the the fact that we were able to catch on to that feature early enough has really helped us. It has its quirks. It also has its challenges. Um, so I'm trying to think what else. What other things are you interested in learning about that? It doesn't work. There's certain situations that it doesn't work. So if people aren't comfortable using Zoom, uh, you have, there has to be a lot of training involved. You have to have confident judges who are the hosts of our meetings. Um, so the lesson learned, there's a lot of trial and error that goes into this stuff. It's still not perfect. Um, it's only as good as the host and the end users, right? I mean, as we're trying to get the defendants on jail who are in custody at the jail, there's just challenges every direction and every day. So... And are you using it in both criminal courts as well as civil courts? We are, yes. Okay. So and how about required interpreter? We are able to provide them with one via Zoom right now. That's fabulous. And how about with self-represented litigants? Are you finding that that is a, a way to move things forward? It's absolutely. It's definitely a challenge. We have allowed some self-represented litigants to actually come inside the courtrooms if that's easier for them. Um, I've we have documentation that we can send out to those folks on how to use Zoom and the interpretation feature on a cell phone, on an Android or on an um, iPhone, on a tablet. We're doing as much as we can to help people along remotely, which is never easy, but they're also welcome to call our help desk if they need help. So anything that we can do to, to move those processes along and through the court, I think everybody benefits from that. It sounds like having a staff member who already had that exposure and experience was a tremendous help in terms of onboarding and selling it as something that would be a good product for the court and in training. Huge. If we had, if we had not had her, I think it wouldn't. It would have taken longer for us to adopt Zoom and to have confidence behind what she was saying and have her be good at that. Gave the judges confidence. It gave the other interpreters confidence. It took a while. It's a very frustrating thing to have to manage, and I, I just keep pointing out these judges and interpreters were, be, were being asked to learn a completely new skill, right? I mean, it's not just courtroom operation. It's now you're integrating technology into this whole piece. And some people just aren't good with that. So it was huge to have her support and her confidence behind the entire project. Yes. And was she also part of training bench officers about how to use it from their end? Yes. That's fabulous. It was a big deal. Yeah, it was awesome. Good. And then Santa Barbara, given that you had this like amazing advantage in terms of having an interpreter, have you had conversations with sister courts that are also using Zoom about how to use kind of these functions? We have had a couple. Yeah. Um, you know, we met with Napa at a certain point and kind of and gave them input on how we were using Zoom. You know, we speak as an IT directors group every once in a while and we all kind of share ideas. So I think everybody's just doing what works best for them. Um, like I said, sometimes, you know, you, if the internet goes out, you're in trouble. If the, if Zoom has a meltdown, you're in trouble. So everybody's just kind of working. A, every day is different and we're, we're about as smooth as we can be at this point, you know, so. Fabulous. As much as we can. Good. 
Well, so in addition to using technology to support interpretations during this COVID crisis, you're also the, currently the recipient of a Judicial Council Technology Grant to develop multilingual digital signage. Can you tell us a little bit about that project? Sure. So yes, we were awarded a generous amount from the Judicial Council for this project. Um, it's replacing paper copies of calendars that are still hung in very dark hallways and in lobbies throughout our courthouse, which is not only cumbersome for our courtroom clerks who have to go through and update those every day, but it's not a very friendly way of walking into a court and trying to figure out where you're supposed to go when you're probably overwhelmed with questions anyway. So we have, we are mid project. Um, we do not have any of this, the displays up already up yet. We have 58 displays that are going to be displayed throughout our county um, in Santa Barbara, Santa Maria, and Lompoc, um, and our juvenile buildings. The, multi, the multilingual displays will be hung in public entrances, outside of courtrooms, and in our office lobbies. They'll provide information to calendars, wayfinding, and other pertinent courtroom information security information like when you're coming through screening um oh and here we go this is a this is just a quick mock-up and a very early stages of what the public will see when they walk into one of our lobbies this was done for one of our criminal lobbies and like i said this is just a really early version but you can see the um multilingual translation we're starting with spanish and then we plan to evolve into the other languages the other top languages for our court, um, any information that we can provide to people before they actually enter the lobbies, I think it's beneficial to both them and us so that they can get their questions answered, possibly if they're in the wrong location, here you go, instead of having to go to a counter and speak with somebody, especially if you need help with um, translation, this way they can get those, you can, they can get there faster, um, they can get some information. We're really lucky to have this program. Um, it's gonna make a huge difference in our courthouse, it'll bring us, kind of into the 21st century a little bit more too, which um, it's just, a, it's a big project. We are very excited about it. We're very grateful that we're doing this. And like I said, we're, we're, we're only, we are supposed to have the displays hung by uh, May 1st. So we're not quite there yet, but if anybody else is interested in this project as well, I'm happy to share more and, you know, give you as much information as I can about it. One of the things I want to underscore about some of those images is the use of infographics as opposed to words so that you kind of don't have to necessarily translate the picture of the cell phone with the line through it. So you can deal with people who aren't necessarily literate and they don't speak English. Right. Um, can you tell a little bit more about the thoughts about what exactly is going to go on and kind of how many languages you ultimately would like to provide? So it's funny that you say that about the pictures. So we have a, one of the dialects, the languages up uh, in Santa Maria, Santa Maria, I'm sorry, doesn't have written language, which is interesting. So it's exciting that we should that we are going to have videos eventually, um, and we're going to do our best to get translation on those videos. That's the purpose, and that would have a you know a video of somebody sitting there speaking to people as they walk in, kind of directing them to where the courtrooms are or answering general questions. So we have Spanish, Mixteco, Zapoteco. There's sign language. We're hoping to try to integrate that at a certain point. Um, we're at, this project is just fluid. It's evolving. So as soon as we can get some input and feedback from actual public walking through our doors again, I think that's going to be really, really beneficial to us. Um, and it's just going to evolve as we learn as well. So yeah, the hope of this is to have several different languages rotating on those screens and just get as much information as we can, even if it takes a couple minutes to um, rotate through all of the slides. Right now we're just using flyers that were already created um, as, as placeholders for content. And then once we have a better idea of how it's gonna be used, then we'll evolve from there. Well, definitely it's the attractive thing about the project is that unlike a physical sign that you put up only to have six months later, have it be outdated and you have to take right. it down and retranslate it, the digital sign just allows you that flexibility to get input from court users and everyone else and to kind of evolve with that. Right. Well, thank you so much. Of course, thank you. So our third panelist today is Paula Cusello Findikulu. Good afternoon, Paula. Good afternoon, thank you for having me. Thank you. So New Mexico has been a leader in developing technology to serve self-represented litigants and LEP court users. Can you share some information on your multilingual court kiosks and the modifications that you made to serve court users during the pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. If we could um, show the slides. 
And before we delve into the technology, um, let me tell you about our language access needs and really how we got here. Um, could we go to the next slide? Well, first and foremost, we are a state and this is where we are. And as you can see, we have a strong Hispanic and Native American presence. Um, we have a large LEP population with roughly 10% of the population uh, reporting to speak English less than very well. And that's per the 2010 census. We certainly have literacy and poverty related challenges. And yes, the rope runner is our state bird. And something that I always like to highlight about New Mexico is that the ability to read and speak the English language is not a requirement to serve as a juror. This means that we really need to be creative and resourceful in how we administer our language access efforts. And this is how really we got here. If we go to the next slide, with all this in mind, um, we created Clara to improve access to our website about three years ago. And um, Michelle, I'm happy you brought up Gina because actually Gina is what inspired us um, to create Clara. Um, Clara speaks English, Spanish, and Navajo and uses voice command technology and offers a series of options through guided navigation. So here you see Clara with uh, Navajo and Spanish. Um, then we thought, how can we bring Clara to the courthouse? And that's the next slide. What if she could really carry out a more freestyle type conversation using natural language processing, which is a branch of artificial intelligence? So we came across a presentation um, by Advanced Robot Solutions that they did at eCourts uh, of a project that they were doing in Michigan about a couple years ago. And so while their existing product uh, was very different from the kiosk that we envision, um, which is what you see here, um, the foundational technology was really similar. And after research and testing, we concluded that uh, through agile design, we could create a smart kiosk and that integrated Clara and natural language processing. If we go to the next slide. So about uh, six months into our initial meeting, we went from sketches on a whiteboard to a prototype that uh, was deployed at the first judicial district courthouse in Santa Fe. And here um, you can see um, the directories mod uh, module. Um, one of the key things that people need to know is where they are and where they need to go. So Clara uses um, voice navigation and, and um, artificial intelligence, again, to provide instructions um, orally, and they also appear on the uh, green dialogue um, box that you see there. If we go to the next slide, this is a key module that we developed after deploying our kiosk, and it provides um, user, uh, it provides uh, court users with information on their case hearings, and it integrates with our case management system, which is Odyssey. The next slide. This is our forms uh, module, and users can browse the different forms by category, by tapping on the screen, or simply asking Clara, um, for say divorce forms. And Clara will present them with all the forms associated with dissolution of marriage. We um, use plain language to make sure that um, it's easier for the self-represented litigants to, to understand. Let's go to the next slide. So once the user has identified the form that they want, they can preview it and they can either pick it up at the clerk's office or they can get it emailed within seconds. Let's go to the next uh, slide. And really the key feature that our kiosk has is that 
users can ask questions at any point during their interaction with Clara. And Clara will present them with options to choose from. So once we go live with the COVID updates that I'll be talking about, we'll continue to increase the number of questions that Clara is able to answer as she really learns from user interaction. As a note of color, um, people ask all sorts of questions from how do I get a bilingual guardianship form to can I get a Ninja Turtle for Christmas? We get all sorts of questions, they are recorded so that we can improve the database and the response. So everything was going well um, until, well, um, COVID happened. And um, just like all of you, we had to make adjustments. Next slide. So what we did is we added a wake word, hi Clara, and a wake wave uh, to initiate navigation and make the kiosk touchless, as you can see at the top of the screen. We also added the ability to connect to a live operator, like people want to talk to a person a lot of times, right? I mean, we, we know that feeling ourselves. So let's go to the next slide. This is the telepresence module. So the user can wave at the infrared sensor, as you see on the top left, and, um, or talk to Clara um, to ask for assistance. And here you see the platform installed in a kiosk at the top and a laptop, which is also a possibility. And you also see the user interfaces for the clerk and the interpreter. Let's go to the next slide. And this is the last one for the kiosk. This is the clerk's um, user interface um, of the telepresence module with all participants joining remotely. This way courthouses that need to rotate personnel due to maximum capacity limits can comply with social distancing while accommodating individuals who really may not have access to a laptop or a cell phone. So this is our kiosk. That is amazing, Bella. Thank you so much. And New Mexico is to be commended for all that you've put together. Well, we got inspiration from California. So I'm very, very happy to be here. So for Clara, you obviously can push this button and you can speak and Clara will hear you. Can Clara speak back? We, do you hear the answers in an audio form as well as what's on the screen? Absolutely. And I'd like to encourage the audience to watch the demonstrations that we share because you will see it really in action. Got it. And so you mentioned that some population of New Mexico has a literacy issue. What has New Mexico thought about in terms of when Clara says, here's a form, here's a place, but it requires some amount of reading. I assume Clara is not reading the entire form. Are, are there ways that the court is providing access for people who may not be able to read the forms themselves? Actually, we have an ongoing project right now through SJI and the National Center for State Courts um, working on scribing. So for now, um, we have the technology to offer the, the forms um, to people, but then we also have um, actual court staff or volunteers who work with, with us to assist individuals in filling out those forms. Thank you so much. So let me ask you another question, which is New Mexico's success with the initial kiosk has now led to building more, uh, which is the development of a customized web-based application for video conferencing. Can you tell us a little bit about that project? Yeah, um, absolutely. So our telepresence module evolved into the idea of having our own custom simultaneous interpreting software, which is currently under development. If we go to the next slide, um, here you will see the, um, the custom active speaker you, um, view um, that we're developing. And you'll see the participants. Um, and a key feature is the clock on the top right corner, um, which is instrumental in an oral, for example, during oral arguments presented before the Supreme Court. 
So we're very excited about the ability to develop our own custom application about the cost savings that this will bring to our program and uh, compared to other available platforms. So we're building exactly what we want. And if we go to the next slide for all the interpreters out there, I wanted to show you the, um, what the interpreter sees really. So that's the um, user interface for the interpreter. Um, you log in as the interpreter uh, or case participant, and then you, you choose who you will be interpreting for, and you can switch back and forth between the different modes and the different languages by selecting the audience. If we go to the next slide, the last thing that I wanted to share with regards to our um, web-based application is that over the past few months, we've been working closely with our judicial information division to use Clara Connect um, for live streaming of Supreme Court um, oral arguments. And this is really a team effort between language access services and our judicial information division. I mean, it, it, it's been uh, quite a journey. So I'd like to play a snippet of Clara Connect in action. Um, what you will see is part of our Supreme Court's educational program. It is uh, the live stream, uh, the recording of a live stream of a Supreme Court hearing in a case that allows students to learn about the judicial system and where they later get a chance um, to meet with one of our Supreme Court justices um, to ask questions about the court's hearing and the role of the judiciary. Now, I'd like you to imagine all that in Spanish. Let's see. Tarde nuevo. Buenos días y bienvenidos a esta sesión de la Corte Suprema de Nuevo México, facilitada por video. Estamos aquí hoy en el caso del Estado contra Adams, número S-1-SC-37722. Mi nombre es Michael Vigil y soy el juez presidente de la Corte Suprema. Para empezar, en nombre de la Corte, quiero darles una cálida y especial bienvenida a todos los estudiantes de preparatorio que están aquí hoy observando estos procedimientos. Observarán la tercera rama del gobierno en acción, algo que muchos adultos nunca han presenciado en sus vidas. La Corte también les agradece al juez David K. Thompson por haber traído este programa al juzgado. El juez Thompson se reunirá con alrededor de 580 estudiantes en nueve escuelas de Alburquerque, Grants y Santa Fe en las próximas semanas para contestar preguntas sobre la audiencia de hoy y la función del Poder Judicial. Las transmisiones en vivo de los argumentos serán archivadas para permitirles a los maestros incorporar este procedimiento de la Corte Suprema en sus planes en las próximas semanas. Bienvenidos, estudiantes. Mi único deseo es que estuvieran aquí en persona para presenciar esto en vivo. Antes de pedirles a los abogados que se presenten en el acta, quiero hacer unos cuantos anuncios para ayudarles a todos con el formato de video que estamos usando. Todos los jueces comparecen por video sin mascarilla para que todos puedan escuchar y ver claramente cuando uno de ellos hablen o hagan preguntas. Ahora voy a presentarlos para asegurarnos de que nos podemos ver y escuchar los unos a los otros. Primero, quiero que todos darles la bienvenida a la juez superior Bárbara Vigil. Buenos días, juez superior. Buenos días, juez presidente. Buenos días, colegas. Y buenos días a los estudiantes a través de todo el estado de Nuevo México. Gracias. En un segundo lugar, déjenme presentarles a la juez Shannon Bacon. Bueno, Well, you get a, a, an idea of what that means for a Spanish-speaking student in New Mexico. It's amazing. So, so um, we're very happy with this effort. This is our Chief Justice. It's a great honor for us to be able to work with the Supreme Court in this capacity and be able to serve um, LEPs in, in New Mexico and be part of this educational project. Thank and you so much, Carla. If we go to the last slide, I just wanted to...
let's see. So, so basically, um, I, I was trying to show you Clara's family tree, sort of speak. And um, we started with, um, with community needs and uh, created three different products uh, through Agile Design. And uh, we're very excited to be able to develop technologies that really um, make our courts more accessible at all points of contact. And while technology is not perfect by any means, we all know that. Um, and we may get frustrated uh, sometimes. Uh, let's think of what this year would have looked like without it. So thank you. Thank you so much, Paola. So I have one question about Clara. So was Clara built from the bottom up or was it based on another platform as you were designing it? So the avatar itself is a SitePal avatar. I believe uh, Gina is too. Um, and then what we did is we incorporated um, voice command to it because a lot of people are not able to read or write the language or as it was mentioned before, there are languages that are really oral based. And so we need to make sure that we are also provide, uh, that we're providing uh, materials in alternative formats and not just in different languages. Got it. It's amazing. And so one of, one of the challenges, of course, is when you have something like Lara, um, is that as you update the information on the courts, you have to go in and make sure that it's available in Spanish and Navajo and the other languages. Can you just tell me what that process is like so that anything that is in English is going to be translated to these other languages? You mean on our website? Yes. So right now our avatar resides in our language access site. And it's text-to-speech technology with the exception, it's scripted, just uh, like Gina. Um, you can basically tell her what to say. Um, with the exception of Navajo. Navajo, we actually had to studio record every single utterance because there's no text-to-speech technology for Navajo. Wow. Thank you so much for that presentation. It was very helpful and illuminating. Thank you for having me. So I wanna thank our panelists for taking the time today to share their experiences and innovative strategies in serving LEP court users. One thing that comes across is that courts continue to have to innovate and to evolve as new challenges are presented. We've had to be extremely creative and to quickly in developing solutions and resources to meet the needs of LEP court users during this pandemic. And as we've heard today, such solutions may pave the way for future language access services that can continue to ensure equal access to the courts even after the pandemic. I also wanna thank the participants who took the time to watch this webinar today. Questions submitted during the session that were not covered today will be reviewed by the Judicial Council staff and may be covered in future webinars or on the webinar website. As I noted earlier today, this webinar has been recorded and will be available on the Judicial Council's Language Access webpage for future viewing. You can also check the website for helpful links and references and contact information shared by our panelists today. There are two more upcoming webinar sessions in this series the Justice Partner and Community Panel on Language Access, which is going to be hosted on April 22nd, 2021 from 12.15 to 1 p.m. Pacific time. The Multilingual Public Outreach Resources, which is going to take place on May 13th, 2021 from 12.15 to 1 p.m. Pacific time. The registration links for these webinars can be found on the Judicial Council's Language Access webpage. Additionally, questions and comments can be sent in advance to each webinar. Thank you everyone. That concludes our session.